tell me how did this journey start for you? Like, when did you know that your calling was, I'm going to be on the internet talking about <laughs> tech and that's what I want to do? Well, I mean, like the, the, the really, really long story, which I won't assault you with the entire journey of how I got here. It predates the internet. Um, I, I was that nice. little kid who was kind of a walking IMDB before there sure. was an internet. Um, I, I, I was pretty young. I want to say I was I was you know, like eight or nine when I was watching a, a rerun of Knight Rider. And uh, it's the episode where Kit has to face the evil car, K-A-R-R, Knight's okay. Automated Roving Robot. And he has a deep, burly, evil voice. And like... I was eight when I realized, holy cow, that's the same voice as Optimus Prime. And, and suddenly, you know, like you always nice. kind of know, like cartoons aren't real and there isn't a talking car that fights crime or commits crimes. Um, but it like it locked in. This was someone's job and they go to different shows. And, and I, like, I don't even know what this guy looks like, but he's this voice. Um, I actually have his voiceover demo, his reel to reel old school tape demo wow. up on my uh, my shelf of tchotchkes behind me. That but is Peter awesome. Cullen was like most responsible. Just that voice actor clicked in my brain like this is a job. This is something people can do. Like my dad goes to work. My mom goes to I mean, she was finishing up a computer science degree. My mom goes to school. Um, someone can just go to a place and be in cartoons and they don't actually have to be in the cartoon like they're just giving their voice. Sure. And that kind of led me down a path where into college I studied theater and psychology. But, you know, I was gigging for the for the website at the time. We were one of the first websites in New Mexico. I mean, sorry, in New Mexico, we were one of the first websites in the country that was doing audio streaming for news broadcasts. So like I'd finish classes, I'd work a part time job. And then at like four in the morning, I'd be getting copy from like AP news feeds and rewriting it and recording it and putting it up on the website in real player. And that's just kind of snowballed from there, moving out to L.A., doing voice casting, doing voice direction and then kind of telling my own stories with technology and audio products kind of led me into being a YouTuber. Right. And, you know, I just I had no idea we'd have this much in common, but I also uh, studied <laughs> theater. Uh, and that's that's kind of primarily what I was doing, doing uh, sound and stuff for that kind of arena. So that's so cool that you also. Yeah, I mean, because when we talk about the Web, I mean, there really isn't an established career path. So, I mean, theater is no. close. Journalism is close. Film production is close, but it's really a multidisciplined approach. The people that are consistently successful at this stuff are drawing from a number of different resources and inspirations and backgrounds. And, and it's kind of like, you know, uh, performance and, and media creation in the more traditional or mainstream markets. Everyone has a wholly unique story on how they get there. And those stories, you can learn a lot, but it's, it, you know, there isn't a path. Like I know kind of what the framework is to become a lawyer, right? Right. There's a, there's a path there. <laughs> We, we kind of have to make our own because e even for as established as social media and video content is, it's still kind of a Wild West industry and everyone seems to come at this from their own angle uh, as they find their own success. Right. And especially, too, because the the landscape of it, like the actual arena where all this stuff happens, changes so frequently. Like, just think about in the last oh, 10 sure. years, how much stuff like YouTube and uh, content and just the, like storytelling through content has mm -hmm. totally exploded in uh, such a such a cool way that it has really led to, um, I don't know, just a lot of people being able to to showcase their brands and in like really unique and interesting ways that can only be done because of now what we have with YouTube and the internet and the way it's all connected. Well, and, and we kind of keep circling around, you know, sort of reinventing older ideas. Um, I mean, in the last five years, I think we've seen some, some highs and some lows for internet institutions, institutions like YouTube, you know, right. uh, from, from advertising issues to algorithm issues. And then you can go and take a look at, um, like there's this new service clubhouse, uh, which is, I, I think a little elitist and only being offered for 
iPhone users, but they're trying to bring back more of an audio based community conversation or roundtable approach. I mean, it kind of feels like when you call into an NPR show, it's so old school in the most right. bleeding edge technology way that you can imagine. So, you know, it, you know, trying to just keep abreast of what's happening and what's evolving and what's changing is is a challenge too but i would say also from the standpoint of being able to carve out a niche from podcasting mm -hmm. to game streaming to live streaming to finishing produced polished videos and now into uh, a returning to a world of more audio focused content it, it's it's um it's a rapidly and fluid uh change uh for for this type of industry Right. And, you know, circling back to audio, uh, in terms of like how, tell me for you, how did your like love of, you know, being interested in, in voice acting and, and how that worked, like how did mm -hmm. that circle to like gaining a really genuine interest in audio and audio tech? Like, did you get a pair of headphones at some point that was seminal for you that you were like, I've never heard this song this way before, or was it something else? You know, how did that, how did that start for you? Yeah, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of those childhood experiences. Um, I, you know, like I, my dad wasn't an audiophile, but he liked to have like a nice stereo system sure. connected. He wanted to, to hear our, his music nicely. Our Sony Trinitron TV, you know, back Rad. in the day. And um, I, I was kind of getting into my own music at the time. And, I, you know, I don't think he he really appreciated it um, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s. Not to say I didn't enjoy his his music. I mean, I still listen to Springsteen and Jethro nice. Tull and, and stuff like that. Oh, so, Jethro I mean, I, Tull I, slaps. Yeah, right? I, so I, I definitely was raised right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, you know, you're kind of getting into your own stuff and, you know, you dabble with a little pop. I was getting into a little pop punk and um, oh, yeah. I, I don't think that was his speed. And so uh, he got me this pair of Koss DJ style headphones. And going from the awful, like, wire band, mesh covered, exposed driver, Sony Walkman style headphones, mm -hmm. this, these were closed back. They had individual volume wheels on each ear. So you could kind of tune, like, if you wanted to go one ear or off ear. You know, it's my first time with a quarter inch jack <sighs> and <laughs> like being able to plug into the big hole on the front. You never of the forget. Stereo. You never forget. You never forget. <laughs> you never go back. Um, and and so that that kind of triggered. I mean, I, that that started when when you did the needle drop on on fresh vinyl. And, and mm -hmm. I was listening and being able to hear a clarity and detail. And it also started my my awareness of being able to block noise. And that's mm -hmm. become a major issue for me in this new modern era of like true wireless earbuds and, and inexpensive consumer solutions is, is how poorly we've educated consumers to protect their hearing. Um, but it was DJ style and then later recording studio uh, monitors that kind of reinforced that. You know, like when I got my first pair of Sennheiser HD 25s, I was doing a lot of uh, location sound mm -hmm. and, and like they're not comfortable to wear. And you're going to sweat buckets, but you splay that headband and they clamp your ears to the side of your skull. And you're like, I I'm in my own audio world of just listening to people on on boom mics and, and wireless labs. This is incredible. It's like I've got bionic hearing. I can't hear someone standing right in front of me, but I can hear that person but in yeah. a football field away when I'm supposed to be doing like sound checks and stuff. It's 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 amazing. So just those kind of capabilities and seeing where especially the pro audio market um, has uh, it works on a on a principle of consistency because because, you know, I, I've got 10, 15 year old headphones that still perform phenomenally. I've got consumer gear that I'm not confident will last a year, mm -hmm. two years because of batteries and wireless tech. And, and it's that that kind of keeps replenishing. It kind of keeps refueling my love for kind of the old school style of gear and and where we can still I mean we can still reach out to general consumers and explain like there are reasons you still might want a cable <laughs> yeah <laughs> attached to your gear um I I never grew out of that I I've, I've always kind of held on to that very first pair of costs going like whoa whoa stuff can sound like stuff <laughs> right and you know this is a good good as time uh, as any to to jump into this topic which we discussed a little bit before we you know went live here yeah, i know that touch on it yeah i know in some of your uh previous content on the internet you have expressed a real fealty toward cables toward wire mm -hmm. 
uh, which I mean, a lot of audiophiles do just because, you know, traditionally that that that's the way you're going to get your best sound because uh, wireless obviously goes through a lot of different um, it, it, it's going to be perfected over time. But I, I just want to know your thoughts on now with like what I would consider this true wireless boom that we have mm-hmm. right now that is so exponentially growing. I mean, I feel like we just get here at Audio 46, like new true wireless earbuds all the time. People are always updating what came before. Um, what are your thoughts on them? Are you one of these audiophile people who thinks that true wireless will always be inferior? Or are you like the convenience plays such a large factor? I'm um, just wanna like what's on my desk right now. Oh wow. So you've got every collection charging and, case ever. And pucks and stuff like that. So so here's here's the deal. Yeah, tell me um, the deal, man. I, I feel like especially in the tech consumer space on YouTube, we're so programmed by YouTube algorithms to just talk about what's popular. So when something kind of hits a <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, when something hits a trend, you know, YouTube kind of reinforces a tentpole popularity mm-hmm. algorithm. And that affects your bottom line. That affects your monetization. It affects your ad revenue. If you stray from that kind of popular content, it's not just, oh, well, people didn't want to watch it. It's YouTube actively gets in between you and your audience. This is a less popular topic and people aren't clicking on it as much in the first hour. So it's a shame, but we're not going to serve this video right. to more people. Even those of those folks who have subscribed to your channel who might just enjoy watching you talk about this, this kind of content. Um, it's a less popular topic. And as much as we can unravel the mystery black box of the YouTube algorithm. So, you know, Apple does something and it's immediately popular and everyone acts like they invented it. it. Yeah, you got to talk about it. Or YouTube is going to say, you're not on the trending topics. Mm, (laughs) You're not going to make as much money. So cables feel old fashioned and cables feel there's there's a consumer idea that cables are somehow less convenient. But we're we're really not doing a good job of expressing the different conveniences. You know, like the, I, I really enjoy Bluetooth neck bands. I, I'm actually not the biggest fan of true wireless because you always have to have like this dinky case that you put them in. You know, hot there's not alert. one. That's a hot take. Yeah, you, you, Like you got to I, I don't know about your pockets, but I try to wear <laughs> pants that fit. And, you know, there are only so many things yeah, I can keep true. in my pockets. Um, and, and it's not one company like I picked up some pixel buds. I'm not picking on Google. This is, I think, a systemic problem or a systemic issue with all. So now you've got three individual little batteries. They're not the most recyclable or repairable. Mm. So now when this dies out and again, I'm not picking on Google. I've got a desk full of the stuff here. Um that's all e-waste and some of it significantly mm-hmm. toxic. Mm-hmm. Rare earth materials go into making this uh, the, these products and they're designed to kind of only have a limited shelf life because audio lasts forever. Good audio gear, if you take care of it, can be a generational um, investment. I'm, I'm recording this on a mic that I got used. Uh, this mic, I want to say, is almost 20 years old now. Um, I got it used when it was already 10 years old. It's a diaphragm and a capsule design that hasn't changed since the late 60s. I I mean, audio audio works. It's not like camera tech, you know, (laughs) like if you invest in audio, audio should have your back. So, you know, there's the convenience of throwing on something wireless and not being directly connected to my phone. I, I totally grok that idea. But we don't talk about all the other inconveniences, like having another thing to charge, having products that wear out faster over time. Totally. You spend $300 on wired studio monitors versus $300 on Bluetooth. I think we can make a pretty, <laughs> uh, a pretty safe bet that 10 years from now, the cabled studio monitors with care are still going to be rocking where you probably flipped through right, some right. other wireless options to kind of keep up. So, so, you know, if you imagine price per year, you know, it's like cabled audio is like three bucks a year versus wireless audio being like a hundred. I mean, I'm just making up numbers on the spot. That's a terrible, strong. Right. But that is such a good way to look at it that I've not heard before and that I don't often hear when exploring these different spheres of like, you know, blogs or YouTube videos Mm -hmm. um, talking about, you know, I think for one thing, repairability is one thing that I think is so overlooked all the time with audio because we always want the newest and the coolest technology. But when you're using like, you know, super proprietary everything and you can't replace any part and uh, 
as soon as anything breaks, which it will, because like there are physical components yeah. and things happen. Well, and the human body is gross. I mean, it is. Oh, don't uh, get we're, started we're, on ear stuff that right? ends I up mean, on your earbuds. Yeah, it's filthy. <laughs> I mean, it really proper is. I mean, I, and I also <laughs> see people who like, you know, who have held on to some gear longer and you're like, you know, you're supposed to swap out those ear tips occasionally, right? Oh, yeah. Ear tips and ear pads. Some people, they Oof. just, they'll leave or, them or on. Or like and... the, the most recent issue we've been seeing, like a buddy of mine, Jason on Painfully Honest Tech just did a video about his AirPods Max where the ear cup design just builds condensation. Like oh, you yeah. take that ear cup off and it, there's like, there's like a little puddle of ear sweat oh. <laughs> that is just hanging out in the back of that ear cup. And one, that's terrible for your health, for your biome. And that's also awful for a piece of consumer electronics that aren't really rated for <laughs> sort of water resistance in that yeah, kind right, of a direct definitely. way. So, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's part and parcel. I, I actually think like the audiophile, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I've been talking all week, so I'm going to get it. My All good, man. All good. The, the actual audiophile conversation where I don't really consider myself an audiophile in the strictest sense of I want to sit in a perfectly treated home theater with tube amplifiers powering these um, impressive monitors. And I come at this from a recording and practicality background. So I'm still an audio snob, but I really care nice. more about like field testing stuff, not sitting down for this luxurious TDK commercial of, of sitting in front of amazing speakers or listening on, you know, $10,000 headphones. Um, but, you know, when we look at audio quality, a lot of these Bluetooth solutions like LDAC have kind of mm -hmm. caught us up for quality. If you're listening to 24 bit yeah. flag files, I still don't feel we've answered reliability, signal stability, where wireless cuts out more than a cable. And then also what you were saying too, all of the back end stuff like recycling, yeah, yeah. repairing, upkeep, maintenance. Um, we we we're, we're making a product more disposable. That should be something that can last much much longer. Like I've got a pair of KZ. Um, these are the ES fours. Uh, they're eighteen dollar dual driver. Chinese in-ear monitor casings and I've had them for years and I still reference them regularly. In oh, I've got some like, Chinese IEMs just for uh, yeah. for uh, some the, practical use, definitely. But this is their second cable because even at 20 you bucks, you can pop the driver off of the cable if you ever need to replace it. And you're like, mm -hmm. that is such a nice consideration for the most budget tier audio solution 100%. I have on my desk. You know, there's no reason why consumers shouldn't be able to appreciate that as a kind of convenience also. Yeah, definitely. And I think that like another sad, not sad, but like a, a true, perhaps unfortunate reality that we keep dancing around is that like, you know, the marketplace doesn't necessarily incentivize making always the most uh, long lasting durable products. Mm -hmm. Like if you came out tomorrow with the one true wireless, like you're going to come out next year with the one Two, the one pro, right. the one pro max, like that's just kind of the game and, uh, and how it goes. But it, it is, it is heartening to me that I see someone like you talking about sustainability and the effects of these things on the environment, because this is stuff that we just don't, we just don't talk about. And we're like, Oh, we're going to pass it off. Like we're, we're not going to deal with mm -hmm. it. It's going to be someone else's problem. Um, and that stuff is just going to come back around so quickly. So I really appreciate someone like you talking about that. Um, and, and for companies yeah. that are just disgustingly profitable, we're uh, well. subsidizing <laughs> their profits by having to deal with the back end. You know, 100%. how a device dies is just as valuable as setting that process up, that product up for the first time. And so, you know, it, I think it's a little easier to make a more profitable profitable stance when you can kind of just sweep the end uh, end of life under the rug and other you know other companies or other governments will have to deal with that um, we just get to keep all of the front end profitability of making that product um, I, I would like to shout out and especially for the audio community if you're interested in kind of that tech conversation I very much enjoy the work done by the folks over at iFixit Okay. Um, I, I feel like when we talk about like right to repair or the durability of gadgets on YouTube, it's more salacious gadget destruction porn. Yeah. Like, let's just see if I can break this thing by Will bending it, it as hard as I can. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. And you're like, yeah. and that's I feel is just as wasteful as like 
oh, uh, I yeah. shot this phone because it looks neat in slow motion when a phone explodes from a 50 cal bullet. You're like, that's not useful. And it's not even really entertaining anymore. Um, but the folks over at iFixit do a phenomenal job of not only doing teardown, so you can see what's really inside your gadgets, how they're constructed, how repairable they might be. They've got like a whole community of people that are genuinely trying to find parts and pieces and ways to repair this stuff. So, I mean, like, you know, not all true wireless are created equal. You know, there are some options out there. If you want to vote with your wallet that you might be able to pop the casing and get a new battery in there and not have to throw away the entire piece like Apple AirPods, you know, that, that kind of stuff, if it matters to you and you really want to try and make a difference on the ground floor, voting with your wallet is, is basically the only leverage we've got. Yeah, man. And let me tell you, here in New York City, like sometimes trying to find an, an electronics repair store, something that should just be such a ubiquitous thing, like it's it's a whole you have to go into a whole like hidden underground subculture because these places like <laughs> Apple and all these other like they, they don't want you to be fixing things. They don't want yeah. you to have replacement parts. They want you to either go through their really expensive proprietary stuff or they want you to just get something new. Like people in New York yeah. don't get electronics fixed. They get new electronics, you know, which mm -hmm. is and I'm sure it's not just here. I'm just talking from my experience, you know, but um, even like we could explode this whole issue of like these huge companies and, and uh, you know, the ethics or lack thereof in terms of um, how they're affecting t the tech space. Like, I, I think you did a video on YouTube about Mark Zuckerberg at some point. No, I I'm, you talked definitely. About no, I mean, I, I you'll have to pardon like my brain is Swiss cheese because I also do like a weekly podcast and I also produce oh, for yeah, a couple yeah. other outlets. And well, yeah. I've talked a lot about Mark Zuckerberg. I can't remember. Right. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm not I'm not remembering the specific <laughs> but, thing. But anyway, but, my point is uh, like that is like the high end extreme of that. But we won't even get into that. Um, <laughs> you touched on something that I did want to ask you, which is yeah, for sure. Yeah, you said I don't necessarily consider myself an audiophile. I love to ask people this question, um, mm -hmm. and I guess it's because, like, do you consider yourself removed from quote unquote audiophile culture? Slash, do you think that exists? Slash, what does that mean to you? Uh, I, I I definitely do to a degree. Um, uh -huh. I again, it's it's um my feelings on this are 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 lovingly snarky and very complex. Sure. Um, but I, I come from a production background. I come from a recording background. Like, you know, out of those early experiences of getting to listen to audio, almost my entire life has been spent trying to capture the human voice or trying to mix the human voice into more complex projects or, or products um, from location mixing to voiceover directing. Um, I, I just I, I I need to hear the perfect representation of the voice that I'm trying to capture. It needs to be the right mic in the right space at the right time with the right performance to capture those granular details that make that voice unique, make that voice special. There is no one winning mic. There is no one winning headphones. There are no winning monitors. It's, mm -hmm. it's the entire chain and the entire process. And, you know, if it's a voice with, you know, a, a buzz or a texture, I need that to be razor sharp. If it's a voice that's mellow and smooth, I need that warmth, that richness, that luxury. It, it's, it's everything I can do to just listen to everyone I'm talking to. And without even thinking about it, I'm thinking like, oh, you know what? You probably don't want to be on that kind of a USB mic, but if you were on a TLM 103, you would sound amazing, <laughs> you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, like in that room right now, you probably don't want to be on a C414, but if you were on, you know, like some old school, sure, you know, radio style gear or like an, 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 an a Sennheiser MD 421, that would sound awesome. I just can't turn it off. Right. It, so like that's every situation I'm in, that is my drug. Mm -hmm. Um, so the representation of that matters. And then for me, that also has a, a, a delightful side effect of uh, being wonderful gear to consume content on. Um, you know, my pursuit sure. for my profession, it, it goes hand in hand with, you know, a, a much higher than average audio experience for listening to music, um, watching movies, and especially playing games. Um, you know, it's not, I don't really run this gaming hardware. I've got like a focus right in front of me right now, but you so, know what? So still works <laughs> pretty well for playing games. Like it Definitely. still sounds really good. So I, I don't, I don't really kind of get into the same vibe. I appreciate the commentary in the community that really get 
into the nitty gritty on, you know, that consumer consumption, high end premium audio. But it's not like visuals. It's not like, you know, this mm-hmm. new range of like 4K and 8K HDR and you know, mini LED and micro LED and OLED and, and all this stuff that we're going to bring to the consumer space for home theater stuff. Um, I, I don't feel like the, the audiophile community has done a great job of expanding its numbers. You know, there isn't an advocate for audiophile gear. I think I the believe. audiophile community can often be. Sorry to cut you off there. I just, I, I this is a really big point of passion for me. I think it can be I- exclusive <laughs> in a lot of ways, oh, which is, yeah. you know, I did a video once on uh, like top five audiophile mistakes, just that you know, being discussed on on the internet. I'm amazed you could narrow it down to five. Boom. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, that's a uh, top five is the tip of the iceberg, but you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm messing. I'm messing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, couldn't know myself. Of course. Yeah. Um, and, and what I put as number four was, was basically don't be a jerk. I was like yeah. so many people in this community, like, you know, because it involves a lot of research because it involves like a lot of, um, you know, gaining your own knowledge. A lot of people can mm-hmm. feel like they're at an elevated, uh, position in it above other people. And it, the re- the reaction that I got to that was people being like, yeah, people suck. Like why are so many audiophile snobs? Like I'm just here, to listen to my music and like it. And I'm like, I feel like that's what it should be. So sorry to cut you off, but I just... No, but I completely agree because that that community kind of built a reputation for being a bit insufferable in their gatekeeping. And, yes. and, yes. and we see that, that pattern play out. I mean, like, look at some of the most entrenched uh, tech communities. You know, like, you really get deep in the weeds on Reddit for iPhones and Androids. And that community is insufferable. You know, they're, they're all, you know, pontificating on the, the <laughs> worth itness of average consumers. But average consumers stopped listening to those techies years ago mm-hmm. because they don't represent a real world applied examination of consumer tech. And I kind of feel audiophiles can often fall into the same trap. And and it's a shame because then we miss out on some solutions that I think your, you know, sort of your general consumer base would prefer. I mean, you still see uh, in informal polling, most people would still prefer to have a headphone jack on their phones. Yes. <laughs> oh, but, you know, I'm still buying Apple, though. Oh, if only there were something I could do. The, no other phone exists, as far as I know, but it would be nice if I could have a headphone jack on my phone again. Womp, womp. You know, like, if, if, if we don't have good advocates and we don't have good ambassadors and we don't have people that can kind of br- cross over, I kind of feel like the, 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 I mean, like, the peak audiophile experience has kind of found a, 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 an unbroken circle loop of selling new product to the same con- consumers. It's just reselling yes. and reselling and reselling. A, a thousand this is a percent. new amp that's coming out. This is a new turntable that's coming out. These are new headphones that are coming out. These are new speakers and monitors that are coming. You've got to try this new sub. But it's it, it's kind of the same little core. And it doesn't seem to spread far from from that little entrenched niche. And and it, it's sad to me because you know, look, look at I, I mean, I, I made a crack at the AirPods Max. I think they're a terrible value for someone who cares about audio quality. They're techie, they're convenient and all those Bluetooth ways we were talking about convenience. Uh But I I can sit someone down and I can plug a pair of uh, planar magnetics into an LG and sit someone down and have them listen to their music. Ask them, you like, what's one of your favorite songs? What's a song you know really well? And then I put these you know, $400 headphones powered by like a $600 phone on their skull and they hear things that they've never heard before. And you can, you can literally watch, like you think, you know, this song, you have not heard this song. Totally. And now we're trying to act like $550 Bluetooth headphones <laughs> for speaker phone calls essentially are somehow the, the, the top of audio. Now, what I just did there is still kind of gatekeepery because if you've been in the Apple ecosystem, AirPods Max are going to sound like an incredible improvement over years of listening sure. on EarPod style headphones. Yes. So I don't want to take away that, yes, they are better, but you're paying so much for an improvement um, to, to Apple's ecosystem that 
kind of just hangs with other solutions that are half the price or less. And, I, yep. <laughs> and, and it's a very difficult conversation to get into because people now also define their lifestyle or their personalities by these labels. You know, so so it's not, you know, like I run into this a lot. I try not to talk too much trash about the consumer who actually picked up this product, but right. I have lots of criticisms over a trillion dollar company. But when I criticize a trillion dollar company, people take it personally because they're in that Apple lifestyle. So it's like I'm attacking especially them, Apple. especially Apple. But, you know, like Samsung, I think, is actually one of the worst. Um, really? Talk you know, like, about that. Yeah. Samsung, I think from the top down, has one of the most infuriatingly hypocritical um, advertising Ooh. structures. Whoa. <laughs> so, think, so think about it. Apple yeah. gave up on mocking their rivals back in the Mac and PC ads, right? Uh -huh. I'm a Mac. I'm a PC. Oh, yeah, look, yeah, the yeah. PC is so stodgy That's and right. old. That's and right. I'm Justin Long. Apple stopped talking about their competition. And I think it was for the betterment of the company because it sets them apart. Now they're the goal. Now they're the standard. They're not referencing their their uh, market share because obviously, like if we're talking about computers, Macs are a tiny fraction of the overall PC computing space. But they now get to elevate their product, and it's a nice product, and they don't have to talk about anyone else. Um, Samsung is took it a step farther in a way that I really don't appreciate from a tech uh, corporation, where they don't just mock Apple. They mock Apple employees in their ads and they mock Apple consumers in their ads. So from, from oh. the top down, from the peak of Samsung PR, it's a trickle down effect of just toxic negativity. You own a Samsung, you're better than those Apple sheep. Oh, and even look at the Apple employees who totally drink the Kool-Aid. It's, it's a hyper toxic way to position your product when we also know that everything Apple does that's profitable for Apple, Samsung's going to copy in of course, six months. Because that's exactly just the cycle of how it goes. But if you're team Samsung, you get to feel good about your purchase because you're better than those Apple sheep and you're better than those wacky Apple employees and you have your Galaxy. But, oh, you know, well, Apple took away the headphone jack and, oh, no, now my Samsung, they took away the headphone jack. Oh, Samsung won't let me replace the battery on my own. Oh, Samsung's going to take the charger out of the box, just like Apple did. It's, it's, all, it's all fake. It's all posturing. It's all marketing. But again, people get caught up in it. And now it's like trying to pull someone out of the Samsung ecosystem is almost as cultish, but is way more cynical than trying to pull mm -hmm. someone out of the Apple ecosystem. Right, because and, they and think I, they're I think so different. Shame. Right. And, and again, yeah. you're talking about the number one consumer electronics manufacturer in the world. 100%. And, and with Apple, you're talking about the number one most profitable consumer electronics company in the world. Th these these are not like little upstart, think different kinds right, of right. companies. They're 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 the top dogs. So we should hold them to a higher standard, not like excuse this kind of terrible behavior and act like, oh, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Samsung gets kind of sarcastic, but, you know, they're still better. It's, it's yeah, true. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And I think to circle back to something you had said a little earlier, I think a big point for me, especially when talking about like, um, you know, engaging with audiophiles on the channel, being part of a channel that is like a resource for audiophiles and a mm -hmm. conversation um, outlet for audiophiles is I feel like we've sometimes we're in danger of losing the fact that I, I, I feel anyway, personally, that audio and gear should be a means to an end. Like you're like you talk about that you kind of break from the 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 modern audiophile mold because you're talking about audio and very practical applications. You're talking about you love that you have resources and technologies to try to perfectly capture a human voice and to try to right. tell a story with the technology. And uh, for me, like I'm a musician, I I, I make music. Like for, for me, it's all about the how can you produce music and create music and re reproduce the music that yeah. you hear in a way that's like really amazing and really lets you appreciate that art and that craftsmanship even more. So I think that a lot of times gear for gear's sake is kind of what is becoming the thing. And to me, that's when I get a little frustrated. That's when I see people start to really act as those gatekeepers and be mm -hmm. exclusive. And I, and I just think that the technology as a means to an end is, is the avenue where we, 
where we welcome everyone and we say like, this is a hobby you should be in because you can find the headphone that you like the most that lets you listen to the music that you like. And, you know, even beyond music, even into anything else. But I feel like the means to an end is, is really why I enjoy, you know, talking about headphones sure. and gear and tech and also cause it's interesting, <clears throat> but um, yeah, the gear for gear's sake is I feel like just a road that leads nowhere in my opinion. Well, and, and, and you know, because I think this kind of applies to most consumer uh, product categories. Um, sure, when, sure. when the product becomes the entertainment, um, mm. I feel that's when you're circling the drain of a of a sort of a closed off or a locked off community. Um, I, I, I like really expensive smartphones because they give me capabilities to right, for, exactly. that, that, that expand on, you know, maybe I don't want to whip out a laptop when I can do something from my phone. Like I'll spend more on a phone when it really will help me displace the need to work from a workstation or to work from a laptop. I mean, there's, 100%. there's a good reason there. All too often, we see, you know, tech reviews, and I'm sorry to kind of keep moving back and forth between tech. No, and audio, it's all but, good, please. This is but good. I'm I'm leading to leading somewhere to back up your point there. I'm with um, you. You know, someone will hold up this fourteen hundred dollar monster phone and then just kind of talk about like, you know, well, I I took a photo in full auto HDR mode and the colors weren't as good, and then it, you know, it was a little bit slower at playing this, you know, totally niche Android game. But also average consumers don't do things like that on their phones. So it's not really worth it to buy this really expensive phone mm -hmm. that no average consumer was shopping because they're all shopping at like the four to six hundred dollar tier. But I'm not going to expand on what this thousand dollar or fourteen hundred dollar phone might be capable of because, you know, most people don't do stuff like that. And to me, it's kind of like, you know, no other industry. And, and I kind of feel this way about audio files in, in a similar, maybe not quite so hyper specific way, but like, could you imagine a car reviewer going like, Hey, I've got the 2021 Corvette Stingray. This is a $90,000 mid engine, amazing sports car, amazing handling package. It's all the bells and whistles, but most average drivers only commute to, to home and to work. So I'm only going to test this amazing flagship car by driving through school zones at 15 miles an hour. <laughs> Like no, no other industry right. would, would suffer that kind of mediocrity right. in the reviewing. And so it, it's the danger of audiophile gear, too, where you get so deep in the weeds and so analytical and so resistive or, or reactive to the novices trying to come up into your craft or to come up into your hobby that you, you start to resemble that techie mindset. The headphones are the entertainment. I disagree. I, I, the headphones enable, like you were saying, the headphones enable the entertainment, right. but the entertainment is, is <laughs> that's the, 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 the reason why we're all here. It's a, you know, it, it's important to me to kind of have those conversations. I want to hear the tape hiss on old Beatles recordings. Right. I, I, I want to hear the impurities of, of a singer like warbling and pitching to try and, and, and harmonize, you know, like I, I I, I got burnt out on Coldplay because I started listening on nicer monitors and like, you know, listening to yellow, you could hear like sort of the lip smack on Chris wow. Martin. You're like, <laughs> oh, oh, but I also have a little misophonia, so I don't want to hear his lips, but these are amazing headphones, but now I don't like the song as much and I can't unhear, you know, like I, I, audio is so much more experiential. And, and you can't just walk into a Best mm -hmm. Buy or a Costco or a Target and, and, you know, like you're assaulted by HDR displays with all the saturation and brightness cranked up to the max. And that's kind of how you pick a TV. You can't do that with speakers. You can't do that with headphones. Like it, it, it's 100%. so much more difficult to translate that experience. So then when you go online and you're trying to look up like, you know, I just want something that's a little nicer. Oh, this whole community of people are talking about like frequency charts and graphs and like, <laughs> I don't even know what these numbers and squiggly lines mean. Oh, well, this other guy on YouTube said the AirPods Max were really, really good. They were the goodest. And mm -hmm. so I'm just going to go with that. I mean, that's what we're doing. That's what we're kind of pushing the audio conversation off to. And especially someone from someone who is doing a bit more work on the tech side yeah. than on the audio side these days. Um, it, it's my warning to those communities. Don't, don't, don't emulate what we're doing over in smartphone land 
try, try to come back, try to come back to sort of the love, the joy, spreading that as the core message, because you're fighting $10 billion a year marketing budgets to sell open ear, true wireless earbuds that sound like garbage. And people <laughs> are going to act like that's the gig because they were really expensive. A hundred percent. So they must be nice. And they're so convenient. We're losing that. We're losing that. The hearts and minds. <laughs> we're losing that plot. So uh, anything to do to kind of rejoin those conversations with your family and friends, starting from the ground floor. Um, I, I'm. I, I've been having success with some crossover products and trying to get my family back into mm -hmm. considering their hearing health, in addition to uh, the quality of their content. Yeah, and um, we are getting a little bit toward the end of our time here, but I do really want to talk on. Um, you do. You talk a lot about uh, hearing health and how earbuds have oh, yeah. have maybe really negatively affected us for the last uh, few years. Um, so I just want to mm -hmm. know how did you arrive at that? Because I think that's a really unique talking point that you focus on. And I think it's really important. So I, I just want to hear how that became of interest to you. Yeah, for sure. Um, again, I got to pick on Apple. Um, oh, here we go. Not to say they're single handedly the cause. There, there, there is nothing I'm going to say here that's scientifically causation, but we see a lot of correlating data from the rise of the iPod through the 10 years that we've had with the iPhone we can almost track consumer trends on spending for things like you know mp3 players to smartphones to true wireless we can almost track you know uh, we can track very consistently similar rates of hearing loss across all age demographics but especially in younger adults and and in in teenagers now, we can't point to this directly as scientific causation, but this is a correlating trend and it's concerning because science takes time to, mm -hmm. to evaluate data and to come to conclusions. So what we're doing over the last two generations of younger consumers, we've been playing an experiment. We've been experimenting with their hearing uh, to pad the profits of these larger corporations. We might find, you know, it's maybe it's this or maybe it's behavioral or maybe it's these other issues. But, you know, I think it's it's very concerning that um, Apple, I believe, has only ever offered two products in their entire history of self-branded audio gear that helped create a seal around the ear. Almost mm -hmm. all of the products that they've released have been lazily, generically, uh, broadly uh, open ear plastic garbage earbuds. And, you know, like they've got a decent driver in them from being cheap, disposable earbuds, but they don't create a seal and it creates a, a it enforces, I should say, um, a listening behavior that is very damaging. You know, you, you can't mm -hmm. block out the world around you. So what do you do? You turn up the volume, you crank it up. Uh, sure. And, and now look, you know, in the EU, we've started noticing on the most recent versions of iOS, they've started enabling a volume limiter that you can't disable as the consumer. And I'm look, watching a lot of people get very upset about that because now they can't turn up the volume like they used to be able to. And the message is still not getting through. You shouldn't have to be listening that loud. Right. If you had good audio products, they should be helping you reduce the noise around you. You shouldn't need to jack up the volume that high. I just did a... Um, a friend of mine teaches high school and I, I did a, a couple of her classes talking about this and just asking like, well, how many of you people listen like near the maximum of your iPhone? And almost every hand went up. Everybody, right? Almost every single hand. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're acting like, well, these are the earbuds that I got from Apple. They must be nice. And you're like, no, they're really not. So um, a couple of years back, I, I, I had the fortune of being able to uh, speak with one of the top audiologists in the country. I've been trying to follow up with some of the news surrounding this. It's not a very sexy topic, but, you know, um, the uh, the concerns are becoming ever increasing. You know, mm -hmm. governments in, in Europe are going to start ena uh, um, enabling uh uh, laws. They're going to start writing laws that that start handling these consumer trends for us because it's going to be very expensive to treat. I mean, we can we can joke about it in the audiophile space and say like, oh, you know, a little tinnitus, or I used to go to concerts <laughs> when I was a kid, or derper right. derper derper der. Um, no, the the data that we're finding, especially as we've only started in earnest studying these behaviors over the last couple uh, over the last say two decades, um, is very concerning. It's not just, oh, I lose a little bit of my hearing when I get older. 
um, there is an increased likelihood of balance issues and and uh, injury from falling later in life because the ear oh, is right. sure. responsible for balance. Definitely. Um, tinnitus should be very concerning. Tinnitus is... Uh, or tinnitus, depending on how you pronounce. It. I, you know, years ago, someone said tinnitus first, so that's how I say it. I say tinnitus, um, but tinnitus is an audio hallucination. Your brain is being starved of a particular kind of information, and it's making it up. And the 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 the, the 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 worst aspects of it can start to resemble some really scary things, like you know, like people who are starting to hear almost speech or voices. Is, is actually kind of an element of a tinnitus style audio hallucination. And later in life, we're starting to see those correlating data trends where people with severe hearing loss are much more likely to have uh, mental uh, degenerative diseases. You know, you know, your listening habits today might inform, you know, your brain falling apart when you're in your 50s that that's that's the reality of this conversation you know our, our bodies break down over time we don't need to help <laughs> mm-hmm. our ears and our brains fall yeah apart. you don't need to speed that process along certainly right and, and especially when we can track now um measurable hearing loss in very very young people so it's great again apple gets to subsidize their profits by putting in cheaper earbuds like they don't even give you silicone tips to put the the buds in your yeah. ears um, that's cheaper for them to make, and it's generically easier for someone to just plop a driver right in front of the ear. How convenient. But when you're in your 30s and you're talking to a doctor, hearing aids are not cheap. So those disposable earbuds or those $200 AirPods you're messing with today, maybe you should look up the three dollars to $5,000 per ear you might need to spend on hearing aids when you're older. And that's why I get so soapboxy and ranty about this right. kind of stuff. Because again, we're going to front load one style of convenience today while completely ignoring the ramifications later on. The theme we, we keep touching on. Um, and you <laughs> <Right>. know, <laughs> it sounds grim and it sounds like, you know, people I'm sure you encounter rude internet people who are like, you're dramatic, but like that stuff is important. Yeah. And it's true. Um, but so- I, I feel it's worth mentioning. No, no. Uh, I, yeah, if anything, it is worth bringing up. Like, hey, just so you know, this potentially Back in the room, bad thing. I'm the snarky guy. We don't have to time. have lunch after. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Um, oh man, real quick before you know, before we have to go, tell just sure. tell me some of your what, what's some of your favorite gear you're listening to? Is it stuff from 20 years ago? Is it you have something in the mail? Tell me what headphones. What stuff? What stuff is exciting you these days? So on the techie side, I'm I'm a huge fan of neck bands. Um, a Bluetooth I neck really band. like uh, th- this new trend of just crazy um, active noise cancellation. Mm-hmm. So um, hearables are really interesting. I've been playing with the new Hero Buds, where they're kind of almost like a like a middle ground between active noise cancellation and hearing aids. Right, like they're sculpting noise out of the environment, and they're trying to highlight human speech. That's um, cool. I suffer from a little hidden hearing loss. If you give me a hearing test in in a, a lab, I, I have amazing hearing for a dude my age. You take me out to a coffee shop, I can't hear anything. Like <laughs> I, I'm reading lips more than I'm really listening to the conversation. Uh-huh. So stuff like that is very encouraging. But I mean, even just the consumer side of like. If we're going to claim that this is convenient and we're going to claim that you, you're going to cut the cable and you're going to spend this kind of money um, for like half the price of, you know, some Apple or Samsung gear. There are some companies out there like um, like one more. I'm a big fan of them. Uh, you know, just just nuking noise in your background and being able to really turn the volume down and still have a really nice like dual driver, or triple driver uh, listening experience is very encouraging. Uh, but for my own listening habits, I kind of waffle back and forth. Um, this last year, I really started dabbling, much to the dismay of my wallet. Um, it was my first year really playing with planar magnetics. Yeah, like you just don't use planers in um, in recording. Like mm-hmm. it's not, it's, it's not very not... practical. Yeah. Well, and and I, I, you know, again, it's it, it is a little bit more of the consumption side where you're looking at a specific color to highlight your own listening tastes, right. as opposed to like more studio grade monitors that, um, mm-hmm, yeah, know, are, are kind of designed to be not very flattering but accurate. Um, so, I mean, even just starting at the cheap end, like the Odysseys, it's an incredible consumer clarity 
you know, it felt like Saran wrap had been pulled off of my Sennheiser 599s. Right. I mean, like, and, and I still love my 599s, but this was like, this was just something else. Mm -hmm. I never, never heard anything like this at that price tier, that com broad compatibility with just like regular home audio equipment. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need an over the top amp. I mean, if you have a nice amp, they, they right, light up course. even more, but you know, you, very accessible. I and mean, again, I keep pointing back to, to those as like a starter drug, you know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like I'm just as likely to pick up, um, uh, my uh, my Audio Technica, my ATH, or um, my Bear Dynamics DT seven seventies, just oh, classic. They, they're never going to go away. Yeah, um, and and especially for my closed back listening, um, when I want that kind of uh, passive isolation, I just know them. You know what I mean? Like. Mm -hmm. It's like a photographer who really knows their camera and their lens. They can predict what the photo is going to look like before they even hit the shutter button. DT 770s, like, I just, I, I, I feel them more than I can really listen to them at this point because I just know what a song is going to sound like or what a voice is going to sound like through those cans. Um, and then I, I just like in reserve, like I always keep a, a an old beat up pair of HD 25s whenever I need to go outside. Just for the back Again, pocket, you know? Yeah, plastic them, and, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and like you can field strip like every part of them. If anything ever breaks on them, you can like just disassemble the whole thing with like mm -hmm. a tiny little Phillips head screwdriver. Like uh, it, they're, they're not great. The base is a little muddy. It's floppy. But, you know, when I need to listen to something out in the field, I clamp those on my head every single time. Repairability. I'll say it again. That's a big thing. It, it matters. It does. It does. <laughs> All right. Well, Juan Bagnell, thank you so much for, for getting on and chatting with us today. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Because I want to tell everyone to go follow you and to go listen to your things because you are the man. Oh, I mean, well, thanks for that. I really appreciate it. And, and again, thank you for, for having me on. Like I said, this was the respite I needed from CES being at home and all sure. digital. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I, you know, I'm all over the place. Um, I'm some gadget guy on Twitter and Twitch, uh, some gadget guy.com where I kind of just keep a rolling inventory of all of my videos and articles and stuff that I'm working on. Uh, you can catch me on new eggs streams. If you want to talk a little bit more like PC building and game. Gaming. I'm going to be covering the wireless industry for sort of like the more businessy side of cell carriers and 4G and 5G for reviews.org. I'm kind of a gun for hire. So you'll see me kind of all around the internet. So it just depends on what you want to focus on. Conversations on tech and gear, maybe it's some gadget guy. Um, if you want to talk about, you know, gaming and PC building, it'll be over on Newegg. All right. Amazing. Well, if you ever want to talk about audio, please be sure you come back here because uh, this has been an absolute joy. This has been uh, Juan, Juan Bagnell, and I'm Franco with Audio 46. Thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll see you soon.